Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this webinar today where um, we will be going through the outputs um, process of our shaping subtransmission report for the South Wales license area. So my name is Ben Godfrey. I'm the Network Strategy Manager for Western Power. Um, in this webinar today, uh, what we're going to do is um, we're going to go through our um, shaping subtransmission report and some of the key outputs, the processes that we undertake to be under uh, to do the modeling uh, and then we'll be looking at the the results of that output and some of the things that we'll be doing into the future so coming on to um, the objectives of why we do this um, this work um, the distribution future energy scenarios and the shaping subtransmission the strategic investment options report um, is critical um, to the work that we do here at WPD. It looks very much at the um, uh, forecast and the growth of demand generation storage um, across our license areas. And it links the um, outturn of those particular technologies against the industry aligned economic and environmental scenarios. And this allows us to build up a really good regional distribution about what types of technology are gonna be connecting into our area and allows us to see um, where we think um, uh, potential clusters of um, uh, technologies, um, particularly uh, low carbon technologies, um, will be introduced on, across our network into the future. And by taking this distribution of those different uh, technologies, we can apply that to our existing network model and we can understand where the pinch points for demand and generation connections may occur uh, across those different scenarios. So we can understand where thermal and voltage limits um, might be um, uh, uh, might be exceeded um, or where those limits might be close to being reached. This allows us to understand future options for reinforcement and provide uh, stakeholders with advance notice of those likely constraints. It also allows us to um, to look across a number of different scenarios and um, provide some recommendations for the strategic low regret investment. So this is where we know that across all credible scenarios, we think that this investment is required and that allows us to, um, to pass that through into our investment plans and make sure that our network is capable of delivering um, uh, the, the energy and the power required um, for all of our customers uh, out into the future. So coming specifically onto the South Wales uh, license area, um, like all of our networks, this network was traditionally designed for demand, um, um, supplied from a, a centralized um, uh, power generation hub um, from, the, from the National Grid Transmission Network. Of course, that has now changed. Um, we can see here from this table, we have a real strong mix of generation in the South Wales area. So we're starting to see some energy storage, although I think um, South Wales is the, has the lowest amount of energy storage connected into our, into our network across our four license areas at the moment. Um, but we have a strong mix, mix of uh, photovoltaic and uh, wind generation and quite a significant amount of um, other, so dispatchable generation connecting onto that network. So we've got roughly um, around about 2.2 gigawatts worth of connected generation um, across the license area. And that corresponds, um, uh, or that um, uh, can be contrasted against the maximum demands that we're experiencing of about 1.9 gigawatts uh, and a minimum, not, a minimum demand of 0.9 gigawatts. Having a look at those figures there, you can see that this really is a, a generation dominated area and um, uh, should all the generation that we've connected so far onto our network um, all be fully exporting, then that would indeed um, uh, cause this to be a, um, uh, uh, cause this license area to export back out onto the transmission network. So it's really flipping up the, the way that the network is designed and it has to accommodate bi um, full bi-directional um, power flows across the network. We can also see that we've got further future um, accepted generation. So just um, almost um, almost a gigawatt's worth of accepted generation that is in the build stage at the moment and we'll be building out in, um, in, in over the next few months um, uh, and years um, uh, to get connected onto the network. 
Um, so potentially we may have almost three gigawatts connected, um, looking at the connected and accepted offers that we've got at the moment. We can also see that there's quite a significant amount of generation in the pipeline. So people looking at inquiries and um, in receipt of offers at the moment. So it's not a, definitely not a stagnant place for getting new generation connected into the network. So looking at the amount of generation that we've got connected on the network, we can see that there's a, a wide mixture of technologies. Uh, and this means that um, uh, unlike some other areas of our network, which have um, massive clusters of one particular generation technology, um, whereby we, we might be seeing a peak just for one particular time or period of the year, uh, within South Wales, because of the wide mixture of generation we've got there, then um, there is a much greater um, chance and likelihood of um, peaks occurring um, and um, uh, throughout the year depending on the, the type of technology driving that particular particular generation export we also see that we have um, some forward power limitations um, which coincide with traditional winter peak and the heating and lighting demands and this will increase as we start seeing more uh, electric vehicles and heat pumps connecting into the network Within the South Wales, we've also implemented active network management to, to mitigate um, transmission equipment constraints um, and some distribution network constraints as well. But it's particularly these transmission constraints that have caused uh, some difficulties for uh, conventional dispatchable generation to connect into the area. Um, uh, but our statement of works um, process has, um, has captured that in, in conjunction with National Grid and we're working with the system operator to, to make sure that we can try and progress projects um, uh, as quickly and as economically as possible. We're starting to see a little bit more of a resurgence in solar connecting onto our network as well and this is really driven by um, the, um, the future proposition of grid parity solar. So we can still see there's quite a bit of interest in, in um, solar continuing to um, uh, be connected into our area, uh, into our network area, uh, particularly in areas where it's predominantly good weather and sunny. So to to highlight the um, the background of of, um, of these particular studies and, and what we're trying to do within Western Power, then. The clean growth strategy uh, from Bayes looks at what the future is going to uh, um, looks to try and deliver on a future ambition about how we can connect more low carbon generation onto our network um, and how uh, by connecting this low carbon generation then we can help decarbonize um, the UK as a whole. So there is um, a big challenge about upgrading our electricity system um, to cope with that, making sure that we're using data and um, technologies that enable us to control the network and devices connected to the network um, to be able to facilitate that. Um, and also it will look, um, we will look to take advantage of new technologies that might be able to provide additional flexibility such as energy storage, um, electric vehicles, vehicle to grid um, and other types of um, demand side response that might be able to help us um, operate our network. So there's a clear intention um, uh, both from industry and from government that we, we need to do this decarbonisation so there's a clear impact on us doing it um, efficiently and economically. And the next graph here kind of shows the, the scale of the challenge. So if we think we're in the um, the middle tranche here, um, uh, between the uh, the darker green and the lighter green um, sections of the of the of the graph, we have had um, quite significant um, decarbonisation um, from uh, emissions um, back at 1990, uh, and that goes to show how much generation we've connected onto the network in in South Wales uh, and the rest of the licence area. But we can see that if we want to truly decarbonise, then there's quite a long um, uh, um, uh, there's quite a large uh, future change that we have to make to be able to fully implement all that decarbonisation and of course that um, presents a particular challenge in you know how do we connect more renewables um, more technologies that can facilitate the low carbon transition onto our network whilst um, not incurring um, uh, spend on our network uh, or, or um, incurring too much investment 
So to be able to make sure that we have plans in place um, to be able to deliver on that decarbonisation, then we use um, scenario planning and um, the scenarios that we're looking at in this particular um, uh, study were aligned to the National Grid FES, um, the 2017 model. So um, the um, analysis that we did to understand um, these numbers was um, completed just a little bit before the 2018 FES was released um, in, uh, towards the uh, um, middle to end of last year. And um, this is the last um, study work that we'll be doing that will be aligned to the 2017 FES. The new studies that we'll be um, that we're starting at the moment in the East Midlands uh, will be aligned to the 2018 FES. Um, but as it is, uh, the 2017 FES has these four different axes, the consumer power, two degrees, steady state and slow progression. And um, there's a balance between prosperity, economic um, activity and green ambition between those different scenarios. But broadly, looking at these different scenarios, it influences the kind of political and economic climate behind the uptake um, trajectories of these different technologies, which allows us to forecast what we think is going to happen into our area. It gives us an even spread um, uh, across the, f the future about how these technologies may be distributed and allows us to put in place uh, a number of plans to be able to mitigate those. So in terms of methodology, what we do is we take our current baseline, that's our existing data and um, or what we've got connected to the network and, and where that's located. We then look at a pipeline projection, which is a kind of short to near term. Um, it looks at all the DG connections, the um, uh, demand connections that we've also got connected into the area and some of the um, local plans um, that we can see um, from um, uh, local authorities and, and other types of um, uh, intelligence that we have um, available to us. And we um, uh, use that to project a, a shorter term uh, pipeline. And then as we go forward into stage three, which is our longer term growth rate out to sort of 2030 and beyond, then we take a much longer view of um, what things are going to be happening across the network in terms of technologies and, and distribution and we try to mold that into how our network is currently developed so we have a nice um, clean um, pipeline from uh, current um, uh, connected activity through to a, a 2030 view of the world and this graph here shows the kind of um, outturn that we're looking at in in south south wales you can see that at the moment we've got that peak um, uh, demand, um, roughly uh, uh, 2.2 gigawatts or so, and uh, we are moving forwards um, through time. We can see that there's a variation in, in what the um, growth weight of that demand is, but of course it does um, uh, all point to there being demand increases across across that network, and that's in line with the additional technologies that we see being deployed um, across our network. Um, couple that with the amount of generation growth that we've got connecting into our network, so we can see we've got a significant amount connected already, but moving forward then uh, we would see that these um, <coughs> Um, technologies, um, there's some uh, divergence in how much generation is connected based on the um, uh, economic and the um, uh, green ambition um, across the, uh, the region. So looking at how we then distribute that type of growth across our network area, we divide the area into geographic sub areas called electricity supply areas, ESAs. And they roughly represent um, uh, the uh, 132 uh, sub-transmission assets that we've got within our network um, and uh, groups them into specific geographic zones, which we can consider for the distribution of those technologies. Uh, this allows us to um, really give some granular um, estimations about what we think the technology uptake is going to be across our area and use that to plan against how our network may need to be developed. And this shows the sub-transmission assets that we've got connected to our network and indeed the transmission network. Um, the reason why we focus on these particular areas is that the transmission, sub-transmission um, networks tend to be the most costly and um, re require um, long-term plans to be able to develop 
um, new infrastructure. So concentrating on making sure that we understand these assets um, helps us um, provide timely response to our customers um, and that's the future needs to our customers. So moving on to how we actually model the network, uh, traditionally we focused on a, um, a, a single edge case um, study uh, at peak demand for our, for our, um, our network. But of course, in, as we are seeing more generation connecting onto our network, then that is no longer the case. And so we've moved towards this um, uh, a number of, of um, more specific cardinal points where we do analysis and uh, we study each half an hour for a number of representative days and that allows us to um, have a much wider view of how our network may, be, may need to develop under different scenarios um, with the mixing technologies that we've got connected. We also do security analysis, so uh, intact network first circuit outages and second circuit outages um, in order to be able to understand how the network, uh, uh, how we can secure for those particular fault conditions and ensure that we've got a, um, a, a secure network and providing a resilient network. All this uh, results in some quite intensive and, and um, protracted uh, network analysis. Uh, should we have to do that by hand? So we have developed um, lots of automation routines to be able to do this and um, speed up the analysis. Um, but it, it still takes us in the region of six months end to end to be able to con uh, conduct this ne uh, network analysis um, across uh, each license area. And this slide shows the um, uh, the progress that we've made in developing our modeling capabilities. Uh, the first um, DFES and um, shaping subtransmission reports that we did probably about two and a half to three years ago now were very much dominated by solar um, generation and we didn't necessarily concentrate very much on the demand side of things. Um, we then moved into South Wales, um, again, so this would be two years ago now, uh, looking at reactive power modelling to try and understand and mitigate voltage constraints in our network. Um, when we then moved across to the Midlands, we saw that the demand-dominated networks there needed some different um, analysis techniques, and that's why we developed um, a more uh, extensive way of modelling our demand networks. Um, most latterly, we've been con concentrating on understanding the security aspects of our network and modeling these advanced um, uh, contingency analysis routines to be able to, to speed that up. And we're just beginning to go and get towards uh, the curtailment calculations so that we can understand what flexibility requirements we might need across different network areas. And that will help us um, provide different options for uh, to um, uh, counter against traditional reinforcement into the future. And now we're going to be going on to results um, of this. Uh, I'm going to hand over to one of my uh, team, Steve Quinn, who will take through some of the results and explain the different GSP areas and some of our um, most critical findings that we found within this uh, study work. Hello, everybody. I'm Steve Quinn. I'm a network strategy engineer at Western Power Distribution. So on this slide, what we've got is an overview by GSP and by year of demand-driven uh, network deficiencies, reinforcement requirements um, across South Wales. And so we've got the scenarios indicated by the little icons. In orange, you've got the steady state scenario. Purple, you've got the slow progression scenario. Blue, consumer power. And green, two degrees. Uh, so, so you can see across South Wales, some areas in all scenarios, something is triggering. There are constraints popping up through the scenarios over the years. Uh, other areas of the network, say Margam GSP, for instance, there's very little going on that's demand driven. Um, sometimes it's more scenario dependent, such as at Pile GSP or Upper Boat. Moving on to this slide, a uh, similar infographic for generation driven network constraints. And it's a much sparser um, matrix. We'll table this one. So it's very scenario dependent and only certain areas of the network have strong generation constraints. As you'll see beneath areas of network that we couldn't study in detail for 2027 due to the sheer scale of demand and generation growth in the 2022 and 2027 scenarios. Now going to take you through the network one GSP at a time and talk about a few of the interesting results that we found. 
So we're going to start in the west with Pembroke GSP, which supplies most of the county of Pembrokeshire in West Wales. We found various potential issues or network constraints in Pembroke GSP. Uh, the first one I want to talk about is the Milford Haven 132KV ring. So the GSP Pembroke is to the south of the Clevi estuary, but most load in Pembrokeshire is centred around Milford Haven 132KV switching station, which is to the north. Uh, between those two substations, you've got three dissimilar circuits, and so transfer of power between the two, be it demand or generation, is constrained by load share and the rating of the smaller circuit for a second circuit outage. Uh, in baseline, those constraints can be managed operationally, but moving out into the scenarios, initially it triggers a fourth circuit between Pembroke and Milford Haven, and that's in 2022. Then by 2027, might need some kind of plant such as a series reactor to improve the load share between those circuits. Another issue to pick up on in Pembroke is the grid transformers. So there's three BSPs in Pembrokeshire. There's Halford West, Milford Haven, and Golden Hill. There's five grid transformers across those sites, and they all run in parallel at 33 kV. So load is shared between them. Um, these scenarios trigger 33 kV splits, so breaking them up to operate independently, either permanently or in some cases just for certain running arrangements. And then a second grid transformer at Milford Haven by 2022, sorry, by 2027, and increasing the rating of the existing grid transformer at Milford Haven in 2022. Moving on to Swansea North GSP, uh, supplies a very large area ranging from Swansea on the south coast of Wales up through Carmarthenshire and uh, Cerrigdigion. We also provide supplies to an area you can see on the map of Scottish Power Manweb's license area. That's the area around Aberystwyth. So, a few interesting points here. We've got the Carmarthenshire and Cerrigdigion network. It's quite similar to the grid transformer issue I described for Pembroke GSP, but this time you've got seven grid, tra grid transformers across five BSPs. And again, all running in parallel at 33 kV. So a very large complex network with interaction between the 132 kV and 33 kV. What we found is that we actually need more detailed studies, including the 33 kV network, assessing 33 kV outages, where loads turn out on that network. But our indicative results just from studying the 132 kV is that as you go out through the scenarios, you might trigger a third 132 kV circuit up to Roast BSP. A second grid transformer also at Rose, and 33 kV splits again to break it up between those seven, sorry, those five BSPs and avoid the risk of cascade events. Looking at the SGTs, um, so Swansea North is already a very large and complex site, got five grid uh, super grid transformers feeding our 132 kV bar and a lot of outgoing circuits. So when reinforcement is triggered, we think that a new GSP might be more appropriate to break up the network. What we're proposing is a GSP near Ferryside, which is about five miles south of Carmarthen, where our 132 kV circuits cross national grid circuits. So taking that opportunity to avoid having to build too many new linear assets. Moving on to Pile GSP. This supplies a coastal area between Swansea and Cardiff, including the town of Bridge End. Few things to talk about here. One is the GSP 132 kV node split. So normally the 132 kV bar at pile is run solid, but in order to maintain bus section breaker 220, we need to split that 132 kV bar into two separate nodes. If we were then to lose SGT1 on a fault, this would actually leave some of the 132 kV network back fed by the 11 kV and 33 kV bars of some BSPs. There's a risk that this could overload the grid transformers at those BSPs. So what we're looking at for that is that we can manage this operationally. Either we would split up the 11 kV and 33 kV bars at those BSPs in anticipation of that fault, or we could make a 132 kV parallel with Swansea North perhaps to ensure that there is secure infeed to both sides of that 132 kV bar. Moving out to 2022, as generation growth exacerbates that constraint, we think that installing a third bus section breaker uh, 320 at Pi 132 kV board could help us to work around that constraint. The SGTs are also a bit of a constraint at Pi, so you've got two SGTs there. SGT2, 240 MVA rating, 
with SGT1, only 180 MVA rating. So in 2022, the scenarios trigger the replacement of SGT1 with a 240 MVA unit. And then by 2027, we think that a third SGT may also be required at pile. Moving on now to Margam GSP. So this GSP supplies the Hinli Valley, uh, which is a bit away from the coast, including the town of Maesteg. And it also supplies Port Talbot Steelworks, which is adjacent to the GSP down near the coast. So a bit of an unusual one here where the GSP isn't in, actually in the area that it mostly supplies. So there's a few constraints here again. Um, a lot of them relate to the complex arrangement of substations that sort of form Markham GSP. You've got the main in-feed from the 275 kV network at Markham GSP, with alternate in-feed from the 132 kV network at Markham BSP, and together they can supply 266 kV bars, one at Grange, the other at Kevin Gergen. Um, in the baseline studies, we identified various hotspots on this complex network, but these can all be resolved by running arrangement changes, revised relay settings, and similar small changes to improve how the network operates. Uh, moving on to 2027, the 66 kV circuits between the Markham complex and the Hindi Valley are potentially overloaded in the two degree scenario by new generation, particularly wind farms. The Hindi Valley is actually something of a hotspot for wind. There's already several wind farms there not all of which connect onto Markham GSP now. Um, some of them, in actual fact, are connecting onto Pile GSP because there is less constraint there. Um, as we see more connections in 2027, we would expect to trigger the reprofiling and reconductoring of overhead sections of the 66 kV circuits, and we also need to overlay the cable sections of those circuits. Upper boat GSP as we move east. Uh, this supplies a large area to the northwest of Cardiff, including Caerphilly, uh, Pontypris, and Merthyr Tydfil. We've got several uh, potential constraints in upper boat hotspots to look at. Uh, one of them is 132kV buzz bar splits. This is quite a similar issue to the PAR 132kV node split, but it's complicated by the topology of the upper boat 132kV bar. Uh, that's a 12-corner mesh, similar to a 4-corner mesh, which is a common textbook topology for a substation, but this is kind of a much larger and more complex version of that topology. Um, because of the way that the circuit breaks are arranged, this can be split into two nodes in a multitude of ways by different second circuit outages, what we call a diagonal split sometimes. These can all be managed operationally, however, by splitting and transferring sections of the network around to ensure that we're anticipating the credible faults for different running arrangements. Another hotspot there is the 275 to 33 kV SGTs. So there's a bit of an unusual network topology at upper boat, where the 33 kV network is supplied both by direct transformation SGTs at upper boat and also a grid transformer up at Mountain Ash BSP a little way away. The arranged outage of that grid transformer at Mountain Ash, followed by the fault loss of either of the SGTs down at upper boat, can overload that remaining SGT. At the moment, we can manage that by careful outage scheduling. 2022, the scenarios would trigger a second GT at Mountain Ash and splitting the 33 kV network permanently between those two substations. This would also require some extra 132 kV switch gear at Minitha Bilva and reprofiling or reconducting the 132 kV circuits between there and Upper Boat. Now, because there's so much going on in Upper Boat, we actually move on to an extra slide for 2027 where there is uh, three more hotspots, but they're actually hotspots we've already seen in 2022. And this is just about how further growth in the scenarios in the later years can exceed the proposals, the solutions that we've put in place in 2022. So something that we need to take into account when triggering reinforcement or flexibility services or other solutions to these problems is what future growth are we expecting to ensure that we don't strand assets. Now, Aberthaw and Cardiff East GSPs. They're the only pair of GSPs in South Wales that run permanently in parallel with each other, sharing a 132 kV network. Together, they supply the Welsh capital city, Cardiff, and to the west of that, the Vale of Glamorgan, including Cowbridge, uh, Cardiff Airport, and a more rural area than the city to the east. So, several hotspots here again. 
A big thing in Abathor and Cardiff East is the load share between those two sites and the potential for through flow between them. Because they form a 132 kV connection across fairly remote parts of National Grid's transmission network, there is the risk that transmission power flows could go via our 132 kV network, particularly during some transmission outages. Accurately assessing this risk will require more detailed network models. So what we've recommended is to improve those models and carry out a joint study of the area with National Grid. Another one, a bit different here, uh, not directly a network issue, is the East Abathor rapid demand growth. So by 2022, in all scenarios, developments around Cardiff Airport would increase Barry and East Abathor BSP's group demand from about 59 megawatts at the moment up to between 224 megawatts and 340 megawatts. The purpose of our scenario planning is to consider a broad range of credible futures. Um, while that can include rapid demand growth like we've projected here, we also need to assess those scenarios where that demand growth doesn't happen, say scenarios where very little growth happens or where growth is dominated by generation rather than demand. In future, we're going to use a challenge and review process to make sure that our scenarios cover that range of credible futures. Now, Uskmouth GSP is to the east of the license area, supplies the city of Newport down on the coast and the surrounding areas, including Chepstow and Cumbran. A couple of hotspots to look at here. There's a few related hotspots, the 132KV series reactor, the SGTs, and the 132KV buzz bar fault. Now, they're all about how the 132KV bar works at Uskmouth. It's quite a complex running arrangement to manage fault level, where you've got two SGTs feeding into two separate bar sections, and then a third SGT available on hot standby, which could replace either of those SGTs in the event of a fault taking them out of service. The two bar sections are also coupled by a series reactor, again to help manage fault level, and loose couples away at our BSPs on the 11 kV, 33 kV, and 66 kV bars. Now, um, Generally, with those issues, we would expect to be able to manage them operationally, but that's something that we intend to work with National Grid to assess and ensure that we have that capability, because there's already some network automation in place to manage that. So we just need to go through and cross the T's and dot the I's on how that automation manages to ensure that in future it continues to achieve capacity without um, compromising the fault level management. Another one to look at is out in 2022, the strong demand growth around Newport. So that's the mega GTs, Newport West BSP and Newport South BSP hotspots. A um, lot of demand growth going on in that area, particularly in the two degrees and consumer power scenarios. We'd expect that to trigger a new BSP perhaps uh, one or two new primary substations fed from Newport South 33 kV and also some 132 kV circuit works to ensure that we get the capacity at Newport South that we need. The last GSP to look at is Rasa GSP. Now this is up to the north of Uskmouth. It supplies a large area uh, going from Ebervale and Usk in the south up through the Brecon Beacons to Sandrin, Dodwells and Ryder in the north. Few hotspots to look at here again. A lot of the baseline hotspots are on the 66 kV network, uh, particularly that north of Abergavenny going up through the Brecon Beacons. Most of these can be managed operationally, and we've also triggered the installation of a capacitor bank already at Glazebury Primary Substation to help with the low voltage uh, hotspot or constraint. By 2022, however, in all of the scenarios, almost all of the RASA network would be constrained by rapid demand and generation growth, quite similar to what I talked about around the Cardiff Airport area. If this growth did go ahead, it would trigger widespread reinforcement, including new SGTs, uh, new GTs, extra reactive compensation, and circuit reinforcement. Again, the challenge and review process that we're introducing should help with that and ensure that the scenarios encompass that broad range of credible futures that I mentioned. So I'll pass back over to my boss, Ben, for a summary of these results. Excellent. Thank you, Steve. Um, so I see that we've got a few questions coming in already um, on the webinar. Um, by all means, if you have any questions on, on any analysis that we've done or the results that we've discussed today, um, uh, drop them down. Uh, any that we don't go get to today, we'll wrap up and stick up under an FAQ on our website. 
So you can see from the results that we've got um, quite um, uh, a, um, a variance in why constraints occur on our network. So both demand and generation is causing constraints um, across the, some of those different um, timescales and some of the different future energy scenarios that we've looked at. Um, you can see that we're not just um, uh, sitting back and waiting for these constraints um, to occur on our network. We've already started um, uh, to implement quite a few operational actions on our network to be able to, um, to mitigate some of these constraints and provide um, either more security, better operability on the network, or increased capacity on the network for both demand and generation. So we're, we're busy working behind the scenes to be able to deliver that. We can see that most networks, if we have, uh, when we go through the rapid growth scenarios um, uh, for both demand and generation, then um, uh, most networks are going to need some form of intervention before 2030. And indeed, some of those networks are going to require um, 20, uh, 22 intervention uh, as well. But we're starting to um, to move towards better DSO operation on our network, and uh, we've um, d uh, implementing flexibility solutions um, across a number of our areas and in South Wales. We know different to that as well. So as and when these uh, constraints are identified and starting to be realised, then we'll be looking at what sort of flexibility. Um, might be able to provide in terms of freeing up additional capacity or deferring reinforcement and um, stopping some of the investment on the long-term build solutions that we've identified. Of course, that will only buy us a certain period of time. And um, uh, once uh, flexibility becomes more expensive than conventional reinforcement, then we will look to do deliver those long-term build solutions. Um, but that, it's not to say that everywhere on a network will require intervention, and uh, as we discussed, um, some of those areas um, do not require um, uh, intervention um, across any of the scenarios that we've looked at. And indeed, um, some of the um, um, areas uh, we may not experience those particular um, uh, extreme uh, growth um, demand and generation growth, and so uh, they may need, not need as much level of uh, intervention as um, as others. But these uh, reinforcements that we've identified, uh, they allow us to um, start building up the plans so that depending on um, what sort of timeline that the constraints are identified and, and manifested, then we have plans in place to be able to deliver those. And we're working uh, alongside um, National Grid and some of our adjacent um, network operators to be able to deliver these plans and ensure that our, the whole system um, can deliver the, the power and energy required for all of the customers connected to it. So in terms of um, next steps, uh, as I say, we've already got a number of um, operational um, uh, uh, mitigations that are in place that are helping us manage some of these uh, constraints al already uh, and ensuring that we've got good operable solutions across our network. Um, we've now, under this work, identified the trigger points for when the generation and demand growth um, will require intervention, and that allows us to have um, concrete thresholds in place so that we can um, uh, start delivering on these reinforcements and the flexibility solutions. Um, this uh, ensures that we have a, a decent plan in, in place to be able to um, deliver the network um, required uh, for future operation. We can see that many of the um, uh, growth points um, are anticipated in the next five years, um, but of course that will really depend on um, what sort of uh, uh, uptake of um, uh, particularly electric vehicles and heat pumps will occur on the network. Uh, and of course we're, we're continually monitoring the uh, demand generation and low flows across our network to ensure that we understand when we need to, um, when those trigger points uh, may be realized and when we need to start implementing some of these plans. We'll definitely be going out for procurement exercises for um, flexibility uh, across those areas when those um, uh, trigger points are reached. Um, and that kind of information will be available to view on our website, either on our signposting information, which can be accessed on westernpower.co.uk forward slash signposting. Uh, or indeed, if we've got, when we have um, uh, concrete uh, requirements for flexibility, then they will be um, visible on flexiblepower.co.uk. Um, and uh, 
you'll be able to access uh, any of our procurement um, exercises. Um, and we're running two lots of procurement runs every year, um, so one every six months to be able to um, bring more flexibility on the network and allow us to have um, uh, allow flexibility to play a part in, in us managing the network out into the future. So looking to the future, we have um, uh, a DSO strategy which identifies a number of sort of smart things that we're doing on the network. Um, this has been in place now for, for um, a, a good 18 months and we're busy working behind, um, uh, working away behind the scenes to be able to deliver on this uh, DSO strategy. Uh, a key part of that is uh, flexibility and uh, we're already making great strides at the moment to deliver flexibility onto our network so we have a rolling program of, uh, of putting flexibility out when reinforcement um, triggers that uh, when conventional reinforcement is triggered and we're looking at whether flexibility can play uh, a more economic role in deferring some of these reinforcements than uh, actual uh, investment in assets on the network so through our Flexible Power brand um, and our website there, flexiblepower.co.uk, we have a number of areas um, where we are requiring flexibility at the moment. So we've got 93.4 megawatts worth of flexibility requirements out at the moment um, uh, uh, across those areas. And that roughly covers about 80 different primary substations and will potentially defer um, up to 25 million pounds worth of reinforcement. We'll be looking to do another round, uh, so, the, so there are ITTs for that are open at the moment and our ITT period will be closing on the 22nd uh, of April. So if you have got flexibility assets in those areas, get on to our Flexible Power website, understand where they are and start submitting, um, uh, get involved with our procurement process. Uh, but of course, if you're not quite there yet or you're looking for new areas, um, particularly um, um, uh, maybe aligned to the, the work that we've um, discussed today, then look at the uh, second round in July and August um, where we'll be rolling out more flexibility zones into the future. The flexibility information um, is available either on the Flexible Power website or on our network flexibility map um, on our uh, on our normal uh, Western Power site. Uh, that shows all the information that you need to assess um, our flexibility system um, requirements. So the, the maximum peak megawatts, the days of the week, the hours of the day and the months of the year when we re might require that response and whether that is a, um, uh, and, w and what direction we require that response. And we're also providing some estimates for megawatt hour utilization so you can really understand the value um, that we might be placing on that flexibility and, and what the potential revenue you might be able to achieve. Uh, furthermore, on our Flexible Power website, we have a value calculator. So if you have flexibility assets in that area, then you can um, type in uh, your maximum uh, export capacity and you can see how much um, value you might be able to attribute to that particular asset in that area. So finally, on to the, on to the summary. Uh, Please keep on those questions coming in and we'll, we'll answer them in just a few minutes in a, a bit of a short Q&A session. Uh, <clears throat> so this is the um, second report um, that we've done in the South Wales and we'll, so we're on the second round of our strategic investment option studies. Uh, well, we can see that there's um, significant change um, potentially uh, required in the South Wales network, uh, but of course that will um, depend on the level of uptake of different technologies and generation, demand and storage. Um, but we can see that if we really want to achieve some of the um, uh, high levels of decarbonisation, then uh, there's plenty of work to be getting, uh, to be getting on with um, uh, and ensuring that we're delivering enough capacity to customers. Um, these reports really demonstrate our commitment to undertaking the whole system network studies. So we're looking at the transmission network and the self-transmission assets, including our distribution assets, to be able to understand what our constraints are and how, what we might be able to do to, to better alleviate them in the future. And we think that it's really crucial to continue doing these studies. Um, so we're definitely committed to undertake these studies, uh, one per license area every six months, and doing so on a two-year rolling basis. Um, and these will align to industry um, uh, future energy scenarios, um, which uh, uh, predominantly um, uh, are aligned to the national grid future energy scenarios. Um, but we're also working with open networks to understand what a whole system future energy scenario might look like and uh, working to make sure that we are 
um, able to use the output from those projects to feed into our network analysis. And we're also looking at how um, flexibility can help us um, with uh, managing the network. And so there's plenty of opportunities uh, that will be coming out of flexibility opportunities into the future. So that's it in terms of the webinar today. Um, we uh, have been through the kind of methodology and the information that we use to be able to determine our future energy scenarios. Uh, we've discussed the methodology that we use for modeling and uh, what the um, type of analysis that we do across our network. And um, we've discussed some of the results that we've, we've um, found, um, including the operational issues that we are resolving at the moment and uh, some of the future issues that may require some more increased um, reinforcement or um, flexibility uh, to be deployed onto the network. Um, we hope it's been interesting and uh, you've given you a, a taste uh, for how we develop in the future um, of the distribution network in uh, South Wales. Um, but if there's any sort of further um, collaboration um, that you uh, you would like to um, to understand or um, any better information that you think we should be in receipt of, then, then please do go and get in touch. So we're just going to crack on and start answering a couple of questions. Um, if you have any more, just fire them through at the moment. Uh, so we've got a question here on uh, the future of coal in uh, South Wales. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this is um, a particular um, uh, interesting point and a good question uh, that affects um, uh, the whole of Wales, sort of generally South Wales, um, uh, across our network. Um, whilst we don't have any directly connected um, coal uh, power stations onto our distribution network, we are behind the same transmission constraints um, and uh, are they affecting um, connection to our network in some circumstances. Um, so, so within our network studies, um, we uh, still have the um, connection agreements for um, uh, for all of the, our existing equipment um, that's connected. Um, uh, we we uh, foresee that to continue into the future, and uh, we're not aware of any um, additional updated information provided by National Grid on um, the timeliness of any of the transmission connected generation. Um, so um, I would say that's probably a, a particular sensitivity of our study, um, um, but we will definitely be uh, making sure that should we receive any additional information on the longevity of those um, sites and we'll uh, revisit the studies and um, ensure that we're delivering uh, the right capacity out um, uh, to our customers um, by updating that information and working with National Grid to um, understand what we can do. Um, I think it's a particular case in point on, on why flexibility might be um, a, a more um, realistic way of managing the network in, in some areas. If we have um, short-term peak overloads um, for particular um, scenarios or um, uh, uh, technology combinations, um, whereby um, uh, they may not be a, a long-term, longer-term um, uh, situation, and they, and they probably won't arise um, to 2025 20 onwards. So um, flexibility um, and things like uh, uh, demand side response uh, could help us manage the network in the short term until we get that longer term picture and stability on the network. Okay, um, we have a question here on um, saying that there's a, a number of recommendations uh, for short term um, operability solutions in the network. Um, what is the timetable for actually implementing those? Um, so from that uh, point, um, a number of these um, uh, issues that we've identified on the network that can potentially constrain customers, we've already started implementing um, solutions to those. So some of those are, um, uh, are things that we already um, realize and, and work within confines, you know, particularly from assessing outage periods to ensure that um, despite a, an underlying change in the demand and generation um, makeup in a particular area, we can still achieve a sufficient uh, maintenance out outage windows um, regardless of when they occur in the, in the year. So we were already doing that analysis and, and starting that kind of work. Um, we have a number of active network management um, 
installations, um, some of those managing distribution constraints and some of them man managing transmission constraints that help us um, uh, connect customers, particularly generation. And certainly um, uh, we are beginning to work with um, new entrants um, and um, uh, new technologies that are coming onto the network that may um, provide um, or instigate um, future constraints, um, particularly electric vehicles. We have a question here on uh, electric vehicles and um, just how many um, do we project uh, to be installed in South Wales by 2030? So um, uh, clearly from our, our last um, report two years ago, we've had the announcement from government that um, uh, 2040 target of banning of uh, internal combustion engine vehicles. So that has had a, quite a large uplift in our thoughts on electric vehicle uptake. Uh, we can see that there's certainly a shifting point in terms of market delivery. So in terms of electric vehicles in Wales, it really depends on that uptake of um, a trajectory and how um, the uh, customers connected into our respond to, to purchasing electric vehicles. But we estimate that the range of EVs by 2030 will be somewhere in the region of 60,000 to, to 350,000. So it's quite a widespread that we've used within our modeling studies, um, but that allows us to, to look at a number of potential scenarios and ensure that um, regardless of the outturn of electric vehicles, we can still um, keep the lights on and um, deliver the networks that um, our customers um, uh, require out into the future. Okay, um, that's the uh, 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 that was the last question that we've had submitted there. So hopefully um, we have answered all your questions as we have gone through. Um, so I'm afraid that's uh, it from us today. But uh, we very much thank you for um, joining us today on the webinar. Again, if there are any um, further collaboration that you would like to go and get involved with us, um, you can download the um, both the um, distribution future energy scenario report and our strategic investment options report from our website um, that is uh, westernpower.co.uk forward slash um, netstrat and that drops you into our network strategy pages um, and uh, by all means we're an open door here so if, if you want to get in touch um, directly through the mailbox or by post uh, then please do get, get in touch with us and um, we can um, provide more information and see what further collaboration we might be able to provide uh, so that's it from me and Steve today. Uh, we thank you for your time and we hope to see you at one of our events in the future. Thank you.